copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Our family police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 163. Go to 40th place in Figueroa and that's with a bank robbery. That's all. Rose and Rose. times in these broadcasts that Rio Grande cracked gasoline is by long odds the favorite motor fuel of the law enforcement and public protective agencies of our local government. But have you ever stopped to think what this really means? So here are the figures for 1936. 3,724,318 gallons of Rio Grande cracked gasoline were used in police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment. At 15 miles to the gallon, this tremendous quantity would drive your car more than 55 million miles around the world, 2,327 times. If you started now and drove 50 miles an hour, 24 hours a day for 127 and a half years, in other words, until the 4th of July in the year 2064, you would still have 19,000 miles to go. Don't you feel the judgment of the men who show such an overwhelming preference for Rio Grande gasoline is to be respected? Isolated cases might be challenged, but there must be an advantage for you in following the lead of so many. Open, Berkeley, Fresno, Santa Barbara, Los Angeles, San Diego, Phoenix, Tucson, Orange County, San Diego County, Maricopa County, and others. This list, you will observe, includes two of the three largest cities in California and the largest county in Arizona, the law enforcement offices of which protect the lives and property of one-third of the people in Arizona. Each of the governmental agencies in this impressive list has specified Rio Grande cracked gasoline exclusively month after month. Why don't you do that this year? Hundreds of thousands of other motorists have found it very much to their advantage. Start in tomorrow. To your Rio Grande independent dealer. Once again, we present Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Davis. Good evening, friends. Tonight, I am not going to follow my usual custom of talking about the crime to follow on calling all cars. Instead, I should like to say a few words about a situation that has become a crisis here in Los Angeles, the problem of traffic fatality. As 1937 ushered itself in to the accompaniment of joyful celebration, it left an old year behind it that had rolled up the staggering traffic death figure of 1,040 persons. In 12 short months, 1,040 people just like you and me, lost their lives on the highway, three-quarters of them because of the carelessness on someone's part. A new year has started, and already the dead have started piling up. That is why I say it is a crisis, a crisis that cannot be allowed to go on unchecked. So tonight, think it over, and then drive accordingly. If you, as citizens, will help by driving carefully and thoughtfully, Perhaps when 1937 rolls into 1938, you will have been instrumental in letting some person alive today live another year. Who knows? That person might be you. Los Angeles, April 15, 1929, 2.30 o'clock. Behind the iron grill marked Keller in the Citizens National Bank at 40th Place in Figueroa, a young man glances at the wall clock, then back to the figure of a woman approaching his window. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I wonder if you'd do me a favor and read this telegram for me. Telegram? Why, yes, that's exactly. Thanks. Oh, but this isn't a telegram. You didn't read it fast. Still. Keep it to yourself. I know what it says. Oh, but there isn't $5,000 in here. Listen, little man. You know what's good for you? Somebody build a cross into this bag and make it fast and quiet. All right. I, I will. Here you are. 
This is all I've got. Wow. Now, listen. You ought to not know about being covered by three guns. If you make a cross to anyone about this for 20 minutes after I walk out of here, it'll be the last thing you ever say. Understand? Yes, I do. Don't forget it. Stay Uncertain as to just what to do, the young fellow stands in his face for five long minutes. A woman's warning words ringing in his ears. Don't tell anyone for 20 minutes or else. Then, by a supreme effort, he takes off the fear that binds him and hurries to the chief teller's office where he tells his story. And when he has finished... A stony silence is his only answer. Then... Do you expect me to believe that? Expect me to believe it? Oh, of course, it's what happened. A woman walked in and asked you for all the money, and you just handed it over and then stood there for five minutes before telling anybody. Well, she told me I'd be killed if I moved for 20 minutes. I didn't want that to happen. Oh, no, of course not. And you didn't want anybody to find out about it until your confederate had plenty of time to get away, did you? What are you talking just about? that. You thought you could get away with this little scheme. You thought everybody would believe your story about a holdup. Well, it won't work. But it's what happened. I don't believe one word of it. And I don't think the manager will do that. However, we'll just go up to his office and see. Come along, Mr. Brown. And strangely enough, the manager of the bank refuses to believe the story either. With the result, the young fellow, after an hour of futile explaining, is discharged. The police, however, after questioning him, failed to find any good reason to arrest him, and the incident gradually blows over. Five months go by, during which the now bitter teller buys a small ranch, settles down to a rural life as a country farmer. Then, on the morning of September 4th, 1929, into the office of Los Angeles burglary detail walks a middle-aged, well-dressed man. Obviously embarrassed, he inquires for the person in charge. Is directed to Lieutenant Teddy Kitwood's desk. Yeah. Um, good morning. <coughs> are, uh, <coughs> are you the uh, gentleman in charge here? Mm, at the moment, yes. Yeah. What can I do for you? <laughs> well, uh, there's a matter come up. Well, that is to say, uh, a matter that I uh, don't think really means anything. <laughs> I see. You see, it's the thing that, uh, that is a matter of fact, I'd, I'd never bother you about it. It was my wife. She insisted. That I support it. Well, uh, go right ahead. What's it all about? I'm not taking up your time. Oh, no, no, not at all. Go right ahead. <laughs> well, you see, we, uh, that is my wife and I, have a young lady living at our house. She's a very nice young lady. Very nice. And uh, I wouldn't want anything to sound as though I were suspicious of her action, but. Uh, uh, say, look here. If it'll help any, whatever you want to tell me will be kept in the strictest confidence. Will that make it easier? Yes, uh, yes, it will. Uh, thank you. You see, this young lady is separated from her husband, and, and she and her baby are sort of living at our house because we felt so sorry for her. My wife is a very sympathetic person. You know how that is. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Well, the thing that caused all this was this, this girl's husband. He, he's something of a loafer, works with, a, with an extra at the studios occasionally, but never makes any money. But so he's been coming over to see her every once in a while, and, and last night he had a lot of money with him. Uh, I mean, really, a large amount. Well, naturally, my wife thought it kind of strange, and as a matter of fact, so did I. But it is in our business, and, well, I was all for letting it go. But you uh, changed your mind? Yes. Well, that is my wife's thing to point it. She feels that uh, you should know about it, and she said that if I wouldn't come down, she would. So I came down. Well, did this man see where he got all this money? Oh, no. no. Naturally, he didn't have to. But I noticed that it was mostly all in $20 bills. That seems rather odd, in not it? Mm, all 20s, eh? Yes, yes, yes. Well, uh, if you leave your name and address and phone number with me, I'll look into it and let you know. Uh, what's this girl's husband's name? Um, Martin. Uh, Jim is his first name, I think. Mm, Jim, uh, yeah, I think Martin. And you say he works as an extra occasionally? Uh, yes, yes. He's in some friends of his. Mm, all right. I'll look into it and let you know. And thanks a lot for coming in. Oh, that, that's quite all right. I... Um, well, today. Lieutenant Kitwood, although not expecting to find anything, browses through several recent police bulletins, finds two on men wanted for bank robbery, glances casually through the data on them. Suddenly, he notices one line that bears a significant statement. 
Oh, Ed. Yeah? Come here a minute, will you? What's on your mind? Hey, listen to this. The bills stolen in this robbery consisted mostly of $20 bills. So? I've got a brainstorm. You saw that fellow I was talking to a while back, middle-aged fellow? Yes. Yeah. And he came in to tell me that a young man whose ex-wife lived at his house flashed a roll of 20s last night. A young man that never has a dime to his name. You figure he might know something about this bank job? Mm-hmm. I figure we might do well to have a talk with him. Okay, when do we start? Well, I think now would be as good a time as any. We'll take this bulletin with us and see how the description checks. Come on. At the address given to him by his earlier visitor, Chip would and Long find him and his wife at home. From them, the two detectives get a good description of Martin. Also with his friends who work in the studios. Also a phone number where Martin lives. A check on the number reveals the address to be that of a residence on Hollywood Boulevard. Accordingly, Chitwood and Long drive there in hopes of finding the suddenly rich young man at home. That must be the place that that auto went a lot. Mm. It thinks his Martin doesn't live alone in the bar that time. Probably has a room. Let's pull in the lot and let the place over. Yeah, okay. Here comes the gent that runs the place. Maybe he knows Martin by sight. Mm, maybe I'll ask him. Anything I can do for you? Uh, we're looking for a fellow that lives around here someplace. I thought maybe you might know him. Uh, he used to live in that big house over there. Well, I might know him at that. Four or five young fellows live there. Most of them work at the studios, I think. What is his name? Uh, uh, Jones. Joe Jones. Joe Jones? Uh, yeah. Well, I don't think that I know anyone by that name. Oh, sort of dark here, good looking young fellow. Well, if a couple of them has dark hair, good looking enough too, for that matter, but, uh, well, that certainly name doesn't sound familiar. Mm, I see. Well, thanks, anyway. Well, that's all right. You might go over and ask at the house yourself. I guess you could find out from them fast enough. Well, oh, sure, that'd be the thing to do, all right. Come along, Ed. Let's drive around. We could walk over there. Well, I think you'd better drive over. Okay, if you want to drive over, we will. Well, you must be getting lazy. Mm, I'm sure, I'm lazy, all right. I'm going to let you go. Thank you are, we drive. Right here, and I keep going straight ahead. But I thought we were going to find I know, it. I know the house, but we're not. I got a hunch that our friend Martin might get wise to that and pull out of him. So we drive to your house and get your wife to call this number and ask for him, you see. And then we give him some story to get him away from there and pick him up. What's the story? <laughs> I don't know yet. You drive, and I'll think it up on the way. <laughs> Don't tell me that you and Eddie are paying me a social call. Oh, hello, dear. Eddie and I have a favor you can do for us. A telephone call. Yeah, here's the number, Eddie. Well, I'll do it, of course. But what's it all about? Well, we're trying to flesh a bird out into the open, Mrs. Long, and thought maybe you'd call this number and ask for Jim Martin. It would help us. What do I do when he answers? Uh, you tell him that you're Mrs. Adams and that uh, Polly is very sick. Mrs. Adams? Polly is sick? That's right. And tell him she wants him to come over to the house right away and uh, make it sound urgent. Whose house? Well, Mrs. Adams. Uh, that's where Polly is. Well, I could ask who Polly is, but I'll try not to. Now let me see if I've got this straight. I'm Mrs. Adams, and Polly is very sick and wants him to come over to the house right away. Right? <laughs> Perfect. Will you do it? Oh, of course I'll do it. But you'd better come along with me while I phone. Just to prompt me if I forget. <laughs> All right, I'll stand right beside you. But the main thing is, make Jim go over to Polly. Calling the number, Mrs. Long contacts a man who says he is Jim Martin. Given the message, he sounds at first skeptical, but finally says he'll be over in 15 minutes. Accordingly, Chipwood and Long lose no time driving to the Adams' house, where they park their car and make plans. Long agrees to watch from across the street while Chipwood takes a position next to the house from where he can see, but is hidden from sight himself. Ten minutes pass. Fifteen minutes, and no sign of the wanted man. Then suddenly a car pulls up across the street. A tall, dark-haired man steps out, starts across, and a straight path for the house. Waiting until he's certain, Chitwood watches. The man crosses the lawn, almost reaches the porch steps. Then, making no noise, he walks up behind him, takes his arm. Well, hello, Jim. Huh? Hey, what the devil is this? Oh, where are you headed for, Jim? I, uh, I, I was just looking for an address, and my name's not Jim. Oh, not Jim. Jim Martin? No. Oh, I never heard of him. Yeah. What is your name? It's, uh, Smith. Bill Smith. Bill Smith, eh? That's certainly an original name. Bill Smith. Well, that's my name. Okay, Bill. What's 
you and I take a ride down to the station. I want the boys to get a look at the eighth wonder of the world, the original Bill Smith. But on the way to the station, Chipwood changes his mind and decides to talk to his suspect first. Driving to an isolated section of Hollywood, Long parks the car under a huge tree, turns off the motor. Hey, what's the idea of stopping here? I just have a desire to see what you've got on you before we go any further, that's all. Get out of the car. Hey, now, wait a minute. You've got my right. I said to get out of the car. All right. You're going to have to get the puff about it. I don't intend to unless you make me. All right. I'll take off your coat and hand it to me. What's the big idea, anyway? All right, all right. Thank you. Take a thorough look through him, Ed, while I look this coat over it. Right. Put your hands over your head, Smith. Don't miss anything, Ed. I have a hunch our friend might have a few things of interest on him. Ah, this doesn't make any sense. I don't know what you're looking for, but you won't find anything on me. Oh, no? What's this, then? Uh, I, I don't know. You don't know? Oh, that's funny. Can you imagine a fellow carrying a roll of $20 bills around with him and not knowing it, Ed? He's got a nice new stamp on the package, too. Bank of America, huh? Where did that come from? You mean right now, or when you stole it from the bank? What do you mean, stole it? Tell us, Mr. Bill Smith. For your information, we've got the finger right on you for that bank job. Now, what I want to know is, do you want to take the rap alone, or do you want to tell us who your pals are? I didn't have anything to do with any bank job. Well, yes, that means you want the whole rap yourself. Huh? You can't prove anything on me. Oh, that's what you say. I know different. Come on, Ed. Let's take this lad to his future home. Maybe a few hours there will loosen his tongue. <laughs> But Martin, although practically as good as convicted on the strength of the evidence found on him, refuses to talk anymore. And later, still denying everything, he's placed in jail. From his wallet, the name Bert Hall is taken on a card with a phone number written below it. Acting on a hunch, this might be another of the gang, sit with him long, check the address, then drive out to a place in the lower Hollywood Hills. And when they arrive there, sudden doubt has failed them. Listen, Eddie, something's wrong here. This is a respectable, high-class neighborhood. Look at the houses. Mm -hmm. This place is much too elegant for a crook to hang out. Oh, look over there. A little girl coming out of the house. Oh, yeah. Now, come on. We got the wrong place. Let's go back and check the address again. Okay. It's a sense that this is the wrong place. But back at the station, another check proves the address to be the same as the phone number. And Chitwood and Long decide that high-class neighborhood or no high-class neighborhood... They are going to investigate. So once again, they drive to the house. And this time, they walk to the door, ring the bell. Uh, I'm going to ask for Bert to, if anything happens, to be ready to push in with me. Yes? Yeah. Oh, hello. Uh, Bert here? No. Well, we're friends of his. He's not here. Oh, working at the studio? Why, yes. You say your friend is here? Uh, that's right, aren't we, Ed? Yeah, sure enough. Do you think you'll be back soon? No, not too late. Probably be 12 or 12.30. Oh, that late, eh? I'm afraid so. Do you still get any of the money left in the bank stick up? Well, uh, so what are you trying to pull? Oh, no, you don't. Get your foot out of the door. Oh, not the telephone. We're coming in. Don't oh, break into my house like this. Oh, all right, lady. All right, now just take it easy. Might as well, because we're all going to sit right here and wait for Bert to come home. Okay. You're cops, aren't you? That's right. Why are you barking up the wrong tree? You know what you're under arrest for. Sure. No, of course not. Well, that's two counts against you. First that slip you made when I asked you about the money, and now this. <laughs> Come on, why don't you relax and tell us all about it? I don't have the faintest idea what you're talking about. As far as I'm concerned, you can sit here till the cows come home. No, we're not interested in cows. All we want right now is your friend, Bert. The cows will have to wait. <laughs> Convinced that they're in the right place, Chipwood and Long settle down to await the missing first arrival. Several hours go by and no sign of him. At a quarter to twelve, Long decides to go outside and keep his eye out in case the man might arrive and get wise. Chipwood and the woman sit inside, staring at one another. Suddenly she grabs her jaw, a look of agony on her face. Oh. Mm, what's the matter? Oh, my teeth. God bless them every once in a while. God bless them. Oh. Mm, anything I can do to make it feel better? No, no. Oh, if I could go into my room and lie on the bed, I, I could put a cold compress on it. That stops the pain. Oh, and I'd lie down here on this couch. No, I want to lie on my own bed. It's more comfortable. You can come in there with me. I can't see what's wrong with you right here on the couch. I want to lie on my own bed. Mm -hmm. Okay, then, all right. Oh, thanks. It's 
got him here. Wait a minute. Yes. I don't like the idea. You want to get in there too badly. I think I'll call my partner and see what you're up to. Oh, it's nothing. It's only that my teeth hurt, sir. Is it? Better not make any fast moves when I open this door. Oh, Ed, give me a minute. Fast. What's up? Not just here. Come on in. Keep a close eye on this woman while I look into that bedroom. Something tells me all is not as it should be. Okay, go ahead. I'll watch it. When he starts, you take care of her and I'll do the rest, right? No one in here. Let's see what's so interesting about this bed. Oh, so this is the answer, huh? These nasty looking guns. Well, they're loaded, too. Well, two more. What's the idea of the arsenal, lady? Well, don't you like talking, eh? Huh? Well, I can tell you in bedroom. You thought I'd call for that toothache gag and walk in here with you, huh? Then all you have to do is reach under the covers and grab one of these guns and blast me to pieces. Is that right? Yeah, sure. Uh, you still don't feel like that. Well, I don't blame you. Well, let's see if there's anything else under here. Well, well, now, isn't this a nice little nest there? What have you found it's out? A roll of twenties big enough to choke a horse. Well, it's just about six of it. I'm not so. All we got to do now is just sit tight and wait for Bert. And won't he be surprised when he gets there? <laughs> But as morning comes, there is still no sign of birth, and the two detectives decide to take the woman to headquarters alone. All the way in, they take turns trying to get her to talk. And all the way in, she refuses to admit any knowledge of anything. At last, as they pull up in front of the Hall of Justice, Chip Wood plays a trump card. Well, here we are. Oh, uh, what's of it? The last chance to talk. I haven't anything to talk about. Oh, that's your funny. Martin had plenty to say. Martin? Why, sure, we've had him here since yesterday. the same way. Why, she's the head of the whole outfit. She's the one that pulled the actual stick up. And she's the one that planned them out. And that husband of hers, Bert, was right with her all the time. They're the ones that engineered everything. I only helped. You know where I get a hold of him? Well, uh, I know he works at the World Picture Studio. If he's not there now, they can get him. Well, that's fine, Martin. In fact, it's better than that. It's perfect. Come on, Ed. We're going to haunt the studio. <laughs> Rushing out to the world pictures lot, Sitwood and Long look up the casting director, who proves to be an old friend of Sitwood, and explain their mission. At first, the director refuses to believe that a bank robber could be working for him. But finally, he checks the list of bit players and finds the name Bert Hall, Freddy, with a private phone listening up. Under Sitwood's instructions, he calls the number, informs the man who answers to have Hall come to the studio for retakes at once. Then they settle down to wait. And for once, their wait is a short one. And an hour after the call, a well-built dark man walks in, places his elbows on the counter, and leans through the little window marked casting, inquires if first hall was called for retake. Silently, Sitwood edges up behind him, reaches around his arms, and snaps a pair of handcuffs on his wrist. Hey, hey what is this? Some sort of a gag? Well, not that you've noticed, sir. You surprised? Well, well, naturally. What's it all about? Well, you don't look very surprised. In fact, you look as though you've been sort of expecting something like that. Well, I haven't. I don't know what you're trying to pull, but it's no good. All problem. right, Bill, let's stop stalling around. We've got your wife. Huh? We've got your friend Martin, and they both talk and talk plenty. Now, what do you say about that? What would you say? And if I were you, I don't know. I'll say this, though. You're certainly pretty much of a heel. What do you mean, heel? Letting your wife hold up those banks all by herself? Well, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Listen, Flatfoot. I didn't let her do those jobs alone. I was right there with a gun all the time. I don't believe it. Yeah, well, I can prove it. I was there on every job, and I was right in the bank when she pulled her axe. Now, what do you think of that? Well, I think you've just fixed yourself up for good, Bert. What do you mean? I thought if I hurt your ego a little, you'd talk. I never saw a punk like you that wouldn't start boasting given a chance. But this time, you've boasted your way right smack into Sam Quinn. Come on, let's join the party. A few days later... A somewhat chagrined Keith Keller once again faces his ex-employee, 
prepares to make a man. Young man, it's good to see you again. Thank you, sir. You uh, know, of course, why I uh, sent for you, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I guess so, sir. Naturally, when I saw by the papers that the police had found the, uh, the criminal who robbed the bank, I realized that perhaps we've been a little hasty about you. Thank you, sir. A little hasty, but uh, I have good news for you. I want to offer you your old job back. Well, <laughs> thank you, sir, but you <laughs> see, I don't want it. You uh, don't want it. No, sir. You see, if I hadn't been fired, I might never have known what a farm was like. But, well, I was fired, and now, well, sir, I don't ever want to leave my farm. I don't want to work in a bank again as long as I live. Thousands of motorists who listen to these Calling All Cars broadcasts during 1936 switched to Rio Grande to crack gasoline in the hope that they, too, would be able to see the thrill of police car performance. They were not disappointed, for independent Rio Grande dealers offer to the public exactly the same Rio Grande to crack gasoline that powers more police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment wherever it is sold than any other brand. Thousands more will switch to Rio Grande to crack gasoline during 1937. Will you be one of them? Why not? Don't be satisfied with sluggish, slow-burning, sputtering gasoline. Rio Grande Crack gasoline costs you no more. And Rio Grande Crack gasoline is broken up, cracked into tiny atoms that burn more readily and more completely. This is why you get quicker starting, faster pickup, greater power. Your independent Rio Grande dealer also offers you the best motor oils you can buy. No wax, no petroleum jelly. No impurities in Sinclair, Pennsylvania, and Sinclair opening motor oil. So free-flowing and heat-resisting, you can use the same grade summer and winter. Sinclair eyes for safety. And have you seen the latest copy of Calling All Cars News? Your independent Rio Grande dealer will be glad to give you a copy free. Brighter and easier this year than ever before. Exclusive screen star news. Thrilling detective stories. Many photographs and illustrated features. Get your copy tomorrow. Attention all cars, the cancellation broadcast 163 regarding a bank holdup. Inspectors are now in custody. That's all. Rolls the switch. Rolls the switch. Rolls the switch. Rolls the switch. Rolls the Frederick Lindsley, bidding you 